Jane Kilkelly. And I'm Carl Thompson. And you're listening to General Intellect Unit. And this time we're back with uh, Chapter 2 of Andrew Feenberg's Transforming Technology. Obviously, if you didn't catch the last one, go back, yada, yada. But, um, yeah, this, um, this chapter is titled uh, Technology and Transition. And this is kind of, like, specifically about um, Marxism, the labor process, and transitions to a socialist future. And it's quite, quite a critique in here, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's... it's um... Uh, this is a really interesting chapter. It's it's the most obvious product of the time when like the original book was written, right? Where like it was in that sort of like late uh, communist era, where uh, which we sort of discussed in our um, in our uh, left wing origins of neoliberalism podcast. But uh, it's in this late era where there's a lot of critiques coming to the surface within the socialist bloc. And there's the imminent uh, prospect of major reform. And uh, so, you know, Feinberg was kind of participating in that discussion of, of like, well, what can we do with Marx from here? What could a future socialism look like? And, you know, of course, how could those lessons be applied to, to future uh, socialist transitions? Um, so it's still absolutely relevant today. Uh, just feels like very much of that era. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and definitely still relevant. Um, yeah, and it, like this, this is a pretty. Um, I think this, this is a really, really good critique, right? Like, there's a lot of, lot of um, points to think about here, um, and that uh, that we're gonna have to grapple with if we intend to do this transition. Um, yeah, and like one, one thing that's obvious about this chapter is that Feinberg has read his marks. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of obscure references in this in this chapter to like, you know, the lesser known Marxist texts. Mm. Yeah, yeah, he, he definitely knows his stuff inside out. Um, but yeah, so like, I mean, the opening section here is um, kind of like going a little bit back over the uh, the history of socialism, where it's kind of like this this wedding of the the critique of alienation from Marx to um, the aspirations of the labor movement. But that this this sort of ends up being kind of thing where the labor movement articulates these like short term demands. And sort of loses track of the the fundamental critique of the industrial society, which slips from there into a uh, a notion of like temporal succession, you know, with um, the disalienation being left for an, an undetermined future date, um, the, the the higher phase. Yeah, this is the lower higher phase argument, right? Like lower phase of communism, higher phase of communism, or socialism followed by communism, right? And and. Um... This argument for temporal succession, I mean, it's still a thing that gets trotted out by the Chinese Communist Party. If you listened to um, uh, the speech he made, like, last year, I think, it was like the address to the party with the big Congress, uh, and, uh, you know, he was appealing to this, this argument, right, that, you know, uh, we're still in, like, the lower phase of communism, and we're... We're getting to the higher phase someday in the distant future, maybe, probably not, actually. Um, right. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah. So that kind of like corruption of the labor movement in the sense of like just appealing to um, small material gains or um, minimum standards of workplace safety, transitioning into the implementation of similar policies in socialist countries. Um, once the once a socialist government was established, yeah, um, and like the, the I mean the argument here is that like that that kind of narrowing of the interpretation of Marx and the the narrowing of the social socialist movement are, are interrelated, right? That like losing track of losing track of fully half of Marx, basically um, a, a a half that is like under recognized and and underdeveloped in many ways. Um, you know, you you just end up with this. Um, this sort of this sort of problem but it also means that like um we often have to answer for this thing of like well didn't marxism fail um yeah yeah uh, you know half of it did <laughs> kind of <you> know? <laughs> <laughs> the the bit that's you know vastly underdeveloped the, the bit that it, the other part of it you know that is in marx that is underdeveloped in mainstream socialist thought is still there and and represents a kind of a, as yet unexplored avenue you know which is nice because it, it, it frees us from this um simple kind of re restatement of the the, the the thesis of the 20th century uh, socialist movement right uh, we, we don't have to go back to Lenin <laughs> 
Yeah, we don't have to go back to Lenin. I mean, the thing, the only thing I have, like, the only kind of issue I have with this chapter is that it it seems to kind of disregard or ignore the extent to which Marxist humanism was influential in, like, Hungary and Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, like, th you know, those were, like, East Bro Bloc countries where this kind of ideology was, like, not implemented in exactly the way that, that Feinberg uh, prescribes here in his reading of Marx, but, like, this stuff was in the air. Like, even Khrushchev appealed to Marxist humanism. Right in a in a rather circumscribed way, but he nevertheless did. So it, it 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 feels like there's a little bit of that like I don't know, just kind of Western Marxist presumption going on here. <laughs> yeah, <sure. laughs> Where it's um, like you know the stuff like the stuff we read in like the left wing origins of neoliberalism, um, like there was a lot of that kind of like humanistic stuff that was in the discourse at the time, right? And and so like I don't I don't think. Fieber actually didn't know about that stuff. I think he just was focusing on... He was presenting the argument in this way for the purposes of clarity, to, to make a stronger argument, to say, well, we've never tried this before, was, it, instead of being, like, getting dragged into, like, uh, you know, well, in Hungary they did this and this, mm. in Yugoslavia, they, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, they, they don't get dragged into that kind of quibbling. Um, but for, for total clarity, I suppose we should stay up front that, like, the the two the two halves uh, of Marx here, uh, or the the two parts of the theory, are the sort of critique of alienation and this sort of rather humanistic sort of critique of the uh, the sort of younger Marx, uh, as it, as it's put, um, versus the kind of critique of exploitation, um, which is which is much more concerned with economics uh, of the of the later Marx, and uh, for for many Marxists, this kind of like the the later Marx being more into the economic stuff sort of justifies that that shift towards focusing on that because it you know you might think oh that's very clearly what he ended up thinking but you know the, the case is made here that like that that critique of alienation the humanistic critique doesn't disappear from marx at all right it, it is actually present throughout all of his writing um, yeah into the late period um, even though you'd be hard pressed to find much of it in Capital Volume Two, mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> suppose, yeah. um. uh, but like that wasn't the only thing he was writing at that time. You know, it's important to remember that when Marx was writing Capital, he was not exclusively writing Capital. Right, he was writing other things as well. And in Capital Volume One, you see quite a bit of humanistic stuff. Right, it's it's um, it's only really in the unfinished. Capital Volume 2 and Capital Volume 3 to some extent that you get into this very sort of like economistic Marx uh, who is really does not bring up the critique of alienation very much. But at the same time, he was writing political reporting. He was doing social critique. Uh, these things were not completely absent from his work. Yeah, uh, certainly. Um, so the sort of Next sort of section brings us on to this kind of notion of a labor process theory, or the the notion that there are actually kind of two two theories in Marx. One being a um, a property theory, which um, you know relates to the economics sort of relations and, and and property relations, and then also a, a labor process theory about organizational forms. Um, and it's the latter which is largely ignored. And yeah, like. This is important, right? Because this is, this is the de-skilling stuff we were talking about earlier. You know, the, the, the essence of the capitalist organizational form is in this labor process organization and how the, how the labor process is structured, how workers relate to the, not, not just how they relate to the means of production in terms of ownership, but how they relate to, relate to the production process itself, which is crucial. I mean, it's, it's weird that this got sort of sidelined, side you know? It's understandable in the sense that providing, like, addressing the economic critique is easier than addressing the alienation critique because you can you can answer the property theory critique, right? The the economic critique, um, management can do that without significantly altering their operational autonomy. But, you know, which is the thing we talked about last episode, right? Uh, but when you get to the alienation critique, well, you can't really be unalienated from your labor process if you are unable to think and act for yourself, right? Another way of putting it is uh, you, can, you can solve the property, th uh, the property critique by shooting a bunch of people and taking their stuff. 
<laughs> it's uh, there's nobody you can shoot to solve the um the organizational sort of structural problem <laughs> yeah. yeah and i mean it gets back to the the sort of problems of efficiency talk right uh so like if the job of a socialist country is to house and feed its workers then um it's it's easy enough to well it's still a very difficult process i mean just look at venezuela today uh, but uh, it, it is it is it is possible to reorganize society and the economy to produce those goods that the workers need, right? But that is according to the criterion of efficiency that's sort of standard across the capitalist world, right? Uh, when you want to talk about a more sophisticated critique, like say what they tried to do in Chile. That's a harder thing to imagine, a harder thing to do. Yeah, um, and I mean, so the, the, this sort of continues with, um, I suppose it's a sort of restatement of the um, operational autonomy bit where um, capitalists obtain this kind of discretionary power over the productive process by de-skilling um, the workers. And then the, the post of capital, the kind of like the seat in which capital sits appears to become the source of all productive force, right? Like this kind of... Um, the, the, the fetish of, of, of capital. Yeah, this is this is the this is the myth of job creators. Yeah, yeah, that like we are the source of everything. You are just um, cogs, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. The the former very popular Elon Musk as mm-hmm. opposed to the current <laughs> Elon Musk. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is um, yeah, this, this is a sort of like a very fundamental kind of fetish or kind of miraculation in the in the system, right? The like the bit bedazzling kind of um spectacle of of capital as as a self generating productivity um which is of course nonsensical but like in 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 de skilling in 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 de skilling the labor force through this um this this organizational process capital can then take on that kind of uh, that that role of like presenting itself that kind of way um, yeah there was um i, I was just going to say that it, this reminded me of a a story I heard of a, a grad student who wrote her thesis about uh, the the self realization of capital, you know, based on that section in in, in Marx's Capital, uh, but she didn't understand that the, like that's not actually the argument, <laughs> and so oh, no. that defense went very poorly. <laughs> oh, no. So yes, uh, the, the point of that critique is to demystify. <laughs> The idea that capital is self-expanding. <laughs> capital is not actually self-expanding. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a really fun term for this that crops up in um, uh, Deleuze and Guattari, that like a miraculation, that like it um, it presents itself as a miraculous force. It's where the uh, the, the, yeah. the the body without organs pretends that it is the the organs and is like look at me i'm so great <laughs> and uh yeah 100 percent. it's a complete mystification um, but people fall for it <laughs> you know even even people who fucking read delos fall for it <laughs> just like what's wrong with these people yeah because <laughs> how can you fucking read that and come out with that with this conclusion that investment comes in and and stuff happens right yeah. like it's like oh yeah you know we got this <laughs> investment deal coming in and the whole city is changing it's it's the miraculous power of capital um, no, it's, yeah. it's nuts. It's, but um, anyway, there's there's a, there's a really crucial sort of point here that like the capital is both sort of pursuing technical progress and power over the worker, and that these two things, these two impulses, can come into collision with each other. Right? That like in in this case, like domination, the, the domination of capital can be a sort of compulsive dysfunction or a kind of neurosis in the system where it both wants to develop itself and suppress the very developmental force that would propel it. Um, yeah. Um, this is, again, like like Graeber says, and like that's what the whole arg- article is about in the Flying Cars and Falling Rate of Profit, is that, like, yes, there is a collision between power over the worker and technical progress. Yeah, and like I mean, the point here is again is that like this 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 division of labor is socially relative, right? Like, um, and that the sort of technology that's used to enforce the division of labor is also socially relative, and that we it is anchored in these particular control problems of capitalism, right? That like um, it's not a general rule of the universe, you know, that this needs to be the case, um, and you know we can do we could we could do better with a different um, social configuration, right? Um, 
Yeah. Um, so moving on, we've got these kind of like three critiques of technology, which are which are pretty interesting and in being kind of um, it's sort of it's sort of relating to um, he's, he's sort of beginning again from from Marx, right? And like and trying to read out what what critique was in there. Um, yeah, because it's incredibly scattered. The <laughs> critique of technology like, and Marx, voluminous like, fucking uh, writings. Right? Yeah, <laughs> years and different books, and yeah, so. It, you know, bring it all together like this is really quite nice yeah. to see. Um, and so it's kind of, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of about the question of like, what does it mean when you say that technology is used badly or that there is a bad use of technology? Right. And you can end up kind of saying that the technology is used for bad ends, you know, which is just a, a product critique of like, which is kind of banal, right? Like, it's just like, Oh, the technology was used to do, achieve some some bad thing at the end which sort of pr still presumes instrumental neutrality right like it presumes that the, the thing itself is neutral it's just that the the thing it was used to do is bad I, going back to the guns example right like yeah guns nuclear power all that kind yeah. of stuff yeah um the next sort of level would be that like you would say that it was used in a bad way like the, the process critique that the, the tools the tools aren't innocent they can be they can be sources of danger and harm right like you can lose your hand to to a thresher you can get scalded by acid, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess this kind of gets to, like, the workplace safety sort of argument, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, the, the kind of ethical demand bit that we were talking about in the previous episode of, like, ethical demands for safety being eventually rolled into the technical code. Um, yeah, or environmental laws or that kind of thing. But so we're seeing that those two, those two critiques so far, the product critique and the process critique, are already sort of accounted for in the in the technical code right like you can you can see them there already but the the bit the bit that steps outside of what we already know is this like design critique to to critique the technology as if it were designed badly that there was a a problem in its in its design not just in its application or in the particular conditions of its use which is um which is interesting right that's 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 the bit that's new um, yes yeah the sort of most it is it is in marks like um there's one part I remember very clearly from Capital, where uh, Capital Volume One, where he's talking about how the nature of tools used in capitalistic slavery in the South for cotton harvesting were marked by the character of the the slavery labor process. Yeah, so the mode of production actually influences the design of the tools not simply their employment uh and yeah i mean like tr traditional marxism is kind of fine with the initial two critiques right like you can kind of the the, the 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 thing that's being posited is that like oh if we, if we just take the technology and direct it towards better ends and also legislate away some like workplace safety stuff then we'll be fine but the design critique remains, right? Like that, you you still have to. That, that traditional Marxist position doesn't entertain the possibility of actual fundamental change in the design of the technology and the labor process. And remember that both of those two things are entangled, right? That like the design of technology, like the, it, as we were saying earlier, that the, the technology is designed to suppress the worker in so many cases, right? Like um, it, it's it's a design of alienation. So if you want to disalienate proper, properly, you need to get to this level of a design critique um, and not just kind of faff about with like, oh, we'll, you know, take, take this thing as it is and presume that it's neutral and just point it at a different place um, or at a different object and, and kind of hope that works out. And, uh, and give the workers gloves because they'll, they'll get burned otherwise, you know? That, that'll do. Yeah, and I mean, this was the... the this was... Um, the design critique was very much um, part of, like, the substance of the, the sort of free software open source critique of, like, Microsoft, right? That... That basically the design of this software is built to the advantage of management and is getting in the way of the efficiency, as we see it, of our work as coders, as as technical workers. So yeah, so I mean it, it does come up uh, in the in the workplace for sure, but generally speaking, has been distinct from the agenda of social democratic and communist parties. Right. Like it's been something that springs up elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a hell of a gap there. Right. Like this, this is a problem of this um, this uh, critique being underdeveloped in the sort of mainstream of socialist thought. Right. That like, I mean, we're, we're seeing uh, I mean, you, you know, 
any almost any sort of time you look at the front page of Jacobin or whatever, it's going to have something about you know uh, contemporary technology or high place high tech workplaces or whatever, or you know gig economy apps or this sort of stuff, um, or the workers thereof. Um, but the, it's not the bits aren't connected. It doesn't seem you know like there isn't. Um, it's it's back at that kind of instrumental thing of like or you know the 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 instrumental and substantive theories of well oh we we can we can either take it or leave it we can have more or less technology but we there's a there's an ingrained presumption that you can't actually change it um in some cases we do get that though like i mean we we looked at notes from below um a good couple of episodes ago and there were hints in there like i mean that the lucas plan is an example of yeah. Um, Lucas plans another excellent yeah. example. So it's it's not that it's completely absent, like it, but it's it's there and it's a little bit scattered. And I think like having this um, having this book right and this 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 sort of set of ideas might be very helpful for um, making um, making those sort of ideas much more concrete and like giving us giving us more traction on this problem as we go forward. Yeah, and the like the Lucas plan critique operates on all three levels the product critique the process critique and the design critique it was on it was operating on all of those levels yeah it was great <laughs> it was fantastic yeah. <laughs> bring back the lucas plan as, as we were talking about back in that episode for anyone that's just catching up now that's uh technology and the worker i don't know what i don't know what episode that was maybe like 14 or 15 or 16 or something good episode you know check it out but um and i i think there's also a documentary on the lucas plan you can go and check out so. okay i wasn't aware of that i would have to check that out um <laughs> so yeah i mean like this is it like technology is a dependent variable in the social system it's not it's not just a sort of innocent thing in itself it's not an alien force from outside it's a it's a thing within the system and um we better better get a grip on it if we're gonna transform the system you know so we come on to labor process theory two, which is just sort of getting back onto the labor process theory a bit. Um, we get this really cool example, actually, of the um, the machine tool automation uh, systems that were um, were being introduced to uh, to factories, and um, I think we alluded to this in the previous episode. But um, it was this thing where, like, in, initially the, the the first kind of numerically controlled machine tools that were introduced were these like record and playback systems where the worker would be the skilled operator would record their movements and then they would be played back and that kind of thing um which as you can imagine was kind of empowering right like for the the worker these weren't widely deployed though what management did instead was they waited it out until a different kind of technology could be developed the um the programmable sort of um machine tools yeah so the 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 control of the machines is literally just like moved into a separate place like off the factory floor yeah yeah um so is this cnc machines and that sort of stuff the programmable yeah okay yeah i had a feeling that was the case but it's not it's not actually spelled out here yeah i um, think this is like braverman's study mm -hmm. is that right or nobles i think it's no, this, yeah, this one's it's nobles Braver's. oh this is nobles yeah okay yeah braverman was the guy with the um property versus labor theory um stuff yeah we're we're we're, we're leaving out a lot of the names of the people that come up here because like we're, we're leaving out a lot of detail because this is extraordinarily yeah. dense but well, I mean, yeah, the, the, those two guys are kind of like the big labor process guys. So I was, I was just thinking, uh, yeah, which one was it? Yeah. But anyway, the, 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 the interesting thing here is that the this kind of means that the management are foregoing like immediate cost savings in exchange for gaining an ideological upper hand. That this, operational this is actually, autonomy. Operational autonomy, right? But it's actually contrary to the the usual sort of um expectations right like that oh it's all it's just about efficiency it's just about cost saving no it's it's about it's about efficiency and cost saving plus the ideological function because they they can't they can't live with it if the floor worker is actually empowered by the tools they use they just can't, they can't handle it you know they, they stay up at night worrying about it um yeah it's it's management ideology <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um, completely so yeah and i mean like this is again further further example that you you know a socialism can only really be created by workers control of the technical process because like if you just like take over the administration of this sort of stuff you end up just recreating this exact same alienation right like you you're you're man like you end up you're you're still a factory worker you're still disempowered but your your supervisor is now a red army guy in, instead of the um the, the dude that was there before right um yeah or like in the case of of, of China, very well could be a PLA guy. 
like <laughs> the army the i don't know i think there's been some reforms but generally speaking the army's invested in a whole lot of different businesses so like very literally you could have a military officer as your <laughs> yeah. boss yeah i suppose <laughs> That's, well, god that, that was i thought i was going for a historical uh, kind of anachronism there but no <laughs> it's like no no actually the real historical record is just that bad it's like as bad as you might expect <laughs> For the um, anyway, the, the the point that needs to be reinforced here is that like different social contexts determine different paths of development. That there there isn't just one linear path uh, of of technological development. There's all these kind of ambivalent, uh, suspended possibilities, and the the different possibilities are then chosen according to the technical code. Right? There's this there's this sort of um, high level logic that like makes the system choose a path that preserves its own operational autonomy. So yeah, I mean, like moving on to um, the next se section on critique and transition, you know, we end up with like two different Marxisms, right? Like the old school one focused on just property, like reforming property uh, relations, and this this new sort of critical alternative, which requires a change in property relations, but also democratic trans transformation of of the base, right? Like it's not just a superstructural change. It's it's good. I like it. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be it would be nice if this happened. <laughs> Agreed. I mean, yeah, this is our agenda, right, on the show. Mm -hmm. um, and this is also like I think it came up again in the previous episode, but like I mean, this is strictly not a two phase thing. Like re relating back to the beginning of this chapter, like this is this isn't the two phase um, transition to to socialism. This is like a an actual emergence of socialism from. The, um, the current um, situation. Yeah, because um, it's not like you get wealthy and then you get democracy, right? It's it's you're dealing with all three levels of critique, and you're dealing with um, yeah, you're dealing with uh, the ownership of the means of production, the control of the means of production, and also the design and uh, pro use process of the means of production. Yeah. Um, um... Yeah, this this chapter is a bit breezier than the intro was. Um, there's there's less of the kind of crunchy <laughs> details, but um, it's um, less references to Kant. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I'm, I'm finding this a bit easier to read. Um, but yeah, like I mean, so we get on to um, contradictions of the transition and then um, this kind of like um, sub subheading of the the concept of ambivalence. And we sort of begin from like the. Um, you know, the notion that, like, for a revolution is starting from a base, you know, it's, it's starting from a place to stand and then proceed from. And that's, that's the inheritance of the inheritance that we get from the current, right? Like, the, the, the current uh, capitalist system, which has a couple of different sort of bits to it, right? Like, if your political institutions, your wage system, you know, is another part of the inheritance, and capitalist management and the technology of alienation, right? Those are the bits you get. That's your starting kit to, to begin from. <laughs> And there's a sort of implicit thing of like the that like the alienated technology is the stuff that you would use to create a different technology, right? Like you you start with the bad tech and you you create the good tech from there. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. I mean, this has been a classic problem of transition, right? Like it is, it was an immediate problem that faced uh, you know Lenin and Trotsky, right? What well, what do we do with this inheritance, and what to what ends do we build, um, and you know, one of the answers was the assembly line, despite how that entrenches the operational autonomy of managers. What a what an immense fucking missed opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think even I think even Feenberg is like, I mean, he's like, yeah, it maybe would have been a little bit difficult to get this this uh, this this innovative design process off the ground mm. in the middle of the Russian Civil War. Yeah, but, yeah uh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, what was the thing we talked uh, about with uh, Red Plenty, where like, um, you know, it's it's hard to do this like highly ambitious technological stuff, such as planning an economy, when you only have an abacus. Yeah, yeah, which is really not very far from the truth, given the condition that Russia was reduced to at that time. Um, but you know, what? How like? How do you import technologies? There has to always be choices. I mean, it, it's they made they made an effort at it in Chile, right? Like it was not a successful revolution, but uh, they did try to implement some of these ideas. Well, they gave it a real shot, yeah. 
But yeah, I mean, the, the sort of the core part of this um, this subsection is just like amb- ambivalent potentialities, right? That there there are there are the possibilities to transform the goal horizon of the society itself, right? Not simply to to change some operations within the same horizon, which you know bears repeating, um, because yeah, I mean, even a lot of a lot of socialists lose lose track of this you know that like we set we just settle into kind of notions of just like taking over the administration of the um status quo and uh staying staying within the it, it's it's the, the tina doctrine over and over again isn't it you know right we, we yes. internalize that there is no alternative yeah i mean i think maybe more more meaty sort of stuff we get in um this other section from from social to political revolution and it kind of tries to provide an account of like how i mean like it's it, the question is like how how do how do socialists get this stuff so wrong you know if if, if this stuff is actually there in, in marx and stuff and is is coherent um and it gives some sort of account of like what appears to happen in marx's writing as he sort of develops um theories of transition yeah i mean he sort of um he raises the social question uh in his early work uh but then increasingly becomes interested in the political question yeah, and it's like um, these are two two very distinct sort of fields, right? Like the the political being from above and the social being from below, and he, he associates like the political with this kind of blind will, and the the, the term will uh, will come up later again as um it'll it's Feinberg sort of like um you know identifies these like phrases and terms and then kind of uses them again and again to build up sort of associations across uh, across different things. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, this is, like, explicitly a reference back to Lusso, right? The volonté générale, the, the, the general will, which was taken up by the Jacobins, um, and which Marx was responding to. It's like, why did the Jacobins fail, right? That was a big question for him. And, uh, and you know, one of the things was that they were just trying to will their way into a just society, um, so, like, I mean, Marx starts out pretty sort of anti-status there, or at least he's he's em- emphasizing more the need for a social revolution, more so than a political uh, state-led revolution. But then eventually shifts back to kind of like the notion of disalienation of the state as the the transition point. Um, so political transition, but then like the economic transition is left hanging, right? Like the the workplace transition, the transition of the base is just sort of kind of absent. Like, I mean. No, it's not really there, right? Like, there's there's some some mention of workplace democracy in limited sense, but I don't know. Yeah, it's it's um, as far as I know, there's there's the critique of design in Marx as as it exists under capitalism, and like that that also applies to some extent to like feudal technologies, if I remember correctly. But there is no like articulation of like, oh, we have to design technologies differently in socialism there is very much this idea of taking over capitalist technologies and using them yeah which i mean we sort of yeah we've we've outlined a lot of problems with that sort of stuff right yeah um yeah there's an interesting thing here uh freenberg brings up that like if um if marx and engels had sort of written like if they had like come out with this kind of full-throated defensive and anti-authoritarian reconfiguration of work then they would have like uh, prefigured the, the the development of workers' councils, which would um, you know kind of which gesture in this direction of like workers' control of, of the the actual production um, uh, relations. Um, but I mean, there's this thing here of like they're in a way they're sort of not really given to speculation. You know that like what's what's that sort of line about um, not wanting to prescribe recipes for the cook cookhouses of the future or something. Um, uh, <laughs> or whatever the hell that is, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's recipes for the cookbooks of the future. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. What, what the fuck is a cookhouse? I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, the, the ultimate thing here is that this is incomplete, right? Like that um, the the labor process critique is underdeveloped in the Marxist canon, and yeah, it's sort of with it being under un, underdeveloped. I mean, Lenin inherits that underdevelopedness, and yeah. It just sort of it goes. It, we we described a lot of this in the previous episode, and you know. Yeah, and I mean, a, a lot of the the criticisms here are oriented towards the Soviet experience, but this goes just as much for social democracy, right? Like it. Um, yeah, yeah, because that that still um, you know recreates the author the authoritarian character of of capitalism because it just is like still capitalism, right? Like it's. 
you're still trapped within this um this alienated sort of relation and this kind of exclusion of um of the mass of people from the design of the system itself whichever way you cut that so i mean next next section then is re- rethinking the transition we're back on the, uh, the the operational autonomy you know um and the the alienation in the the economy and the state like that's that's what flows there's there's two different kinds of alienation here that flow out from operational autonomy yeah there's bosses in the workplace and bosses in the government and like i think is is it in this section that um it um you know it seems as if um like it it is like be- because um those two functions are so often collapsed into the same person like that the it be- it becomes easier to believe that the solving the um alienation in the state or like say the solving the um property problem is also solving the uh labor process problem right because they they happen to be kind of in the same the same set of people uh yes uh well like in dis- displacing the ruling class yeah yeah um i i think that uh that's certainly going on it's also just it's easier to imagine taking over the state and then you can sort of at a general level like nationalize industries or whatever mm. but because the technical code is uh what operates in the workplace um in the in the factory in the economy as opposed to the implementation of political directives it's it's harder to imagine how to actually deal with the operational autonomy at the workplace level except to simply say we'll change out the managers and do the same thing yeah Yeah. right um or or you know add in some some safety health and safety stuff but (laughs) yeah basically the same thing and i mean it's easy to understand because like this isn't a thing most people are capable of doing very well right now uh and certainly not activists right yeah (laughs) Yeah, like yeah that's not really their area of expertise. Their area of expertise is political organizing. So, I mean, they're probably going to be a lot better at reorganizing the state than they are going to be at uh, reorganizing the workplace. So th- this is a kind of a parallel problem even to um, the project that Feinberg is undertaking here, where I think back in the previous chapter, uh, he was talking about bridging the gap between... Um, you know the sort of critical theory academy and um and like uh, technological expertise and i mean our part of our project on the show is to kind of like uh, articulate this like you know socialism in terms of you know technology and in terms of like um you know modern technology and technological expertise as well and like yeah that that gap also needs to be bridged right that like um because otherwise you just end up with the same the same old change of like um because like as as Feinberg puts it here socialism is not a policy but a movement of social change that can be created only from below the the the, the transformation kind of can't be enacted solely by fiat so yeah i don't know like it, it's sort of I, I wonder and i kind of worry about the the shape of um some of these kind of social movements that are that, that are developing now which are in danger of just re just repeating I suppose the same old mistake, you know, of like taking over, taking over some part of the state, finding that the operational logic and the kind of automata of capitalism itself is still there, is still a thing they need to deal with, yet not have the capacity to deal with it at all, and just go, well, I guess we're, I guess we're doing assembly lines again, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, and I guess that's why things like the Lucas Plan are are getting talked about right yeah. now. Is or Cybersyn, you know. You know, the, the last generation of Marxists or socialists, uh, like, you know, people like Panitch or people like Feinberg articulated these critiques, right? Like, so Panitch in the case of the state, uh, Feinberg in the case of, of technology— uh, but uh, the efforts to sort of make that happen were not were not very successful. Um, now there is kind of an opportunity to make some of that happen, but yes, it's it's not probably as well known as it needs to be, and there is the, always the danger that you we will just collapse back into sort of ineffectual control of the state. 
and uh, which doesn't really advance the cause of socialism no. very far. And that'll that'll give the substantivists more fucking ammo, right? Like if we just do that again, right? Like they'll be like, you see, you see, Kaczynski was right. You can't reform the shit, you know? Um, yeah, a broken clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Even a reactionary clock is right twice a day, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or exactly. yeah. <laughs> Even a primitivist clock is right twice a day. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe once. I don't know. It might just be a sundial. <laughs> Hard to say. I just I love I love picking on Ted. He's um he's a he's a very easy punk <laughs> punk punk back. I was uh, I was saying in the green room uh, that like yeah over the, over the summer break I was kind of reading um yeah Kaczynski's whatever the fuck his manifesto was called uh just for a bit of fun and I was like he's really frustrating because he's got the the alienation and the domination down but he then swerves off into just ridiculous crank bullshit instead of like because he he doesn't yeah. have a class analysis he has no concept of class whatsoever he has no concept of like the sort of unified logic of the system being informed by social interests. And so he, he is incapable of reaching the right conclusion. Yeah, it's that sort of classic, like, anti-Semitism is the, the socialism of idiots kind of thing, right? That, like, that they just... <laughs> like, if, if, if you're looking for conspiracy and domination in all the wrong places... Um, then yeah, you're not going to come to a very good analysis, even if you can see around you domination. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I mean, it's the, the 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 yeah, the domination just just overwhelms you, and you have no actual sort of basis to understand it. That's that's a thing I, I see a lot of in like um, I don't know it's a repeating theme where I um either read something or or listen to something or you know there's there's some thinker that like has has a decent analysis overall but the fact like they're they're missing the social component entirely means that they they just arrive at their completely wrong conclusions on a bunch of stuff we saw that with the accelerationists didn't we you know that they were because, <laughs> because they el elided um human influence over the design of the system and social um the interests of capital shaping you know the shape of things they're just like because that's missing they just like go off in just ridiculous fucking trajectories um yeah you can kind of see what feenberg is is suggesting here as like a rather deep and sophisticated notion of the kind of like a uh, navigational accelerationism that we saw yeah. uh from like cernicek and stuff yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is the smart version of that stuff. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Which, yeah, and again, is it accelerationism? Is it Not really so sure about that, <laughs> but hey. Yeah. The only, yeah, I don't know. Is, is it that the only good kind of accelerationism is not accelerationism? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> uh, that's another that's another previous episode for new new listeners to uh, to catch up on. Um, yes. Yeah. So, like, I mean, th there's this final section then on like the limits of Marxism that like um because like w when Marx was laying down this critique and I think when a lot of um, socialists were kind of doing their work, um, this technological mediation was a feature of the workplace mostly, and was the, the world outside the workplace was largely untouched. Well, I mean. You know, to the extent that it can be, you know, because the workplace is such a focal point for so much of the society. Anyway, the point is that today, this technological mediation is everywhere. In, in every layer of the society, it, it is saturated through the whole thing. And so the, the, the movement to build an emancipatory politics can't just be limited to the labor movement. It has to be, um, you know, where all of this stuff is, you know, across, you know, race and gender lines and so on and so forth. But it, it also mean it also doesn't mean that we abandon the labor movement, right? Like this is a, um, this is a, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of multiplicity rather than being, um, rather than any one of these things being the, the site of uh, the, the exclusive site of struggle. Yeah. And I, I think that, um, this is very much an argument of its time, right? Um, I feel like we've actually kind of moved back the other direction. Uh huh. Um, that I think that that people, I think people have have increasingly recognized the centrality of the struggle of the working class. It's just the definition of of who counts as an agent in the working class has become more uh, sophisticated. But like, really, since the time that this book was written, I feel like more so than the politics of, or more so than technical politics. Working class politics have become uh, quite vital and relevant again. 
like, you know, technical politics are happening, but when we talk about the socialism of the moment, it's people addressing really quite, um, I mean, I, w I definitely would not say exclusively material concerns, but I, I think that the material concerns have become more of a concern for sure. And that the working class struggle has become more intersectional, but it's still a working class struggle. Like we've, we've, we've kind of, I think we've kind of gone through like a period of intersectionality where it was sort of like, oh, these are all separate things. And like, now we've kind of realized like, yeah, maybe like upper class feminism ain't so great. Right. Like, like maybe we need maybe we need working class feminism. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I really do feel like the the these I don't know, like there's been a dialectic, right? Like <laughs> that yeah. uh, these 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 sort of separate, quote unquote, separate concerns have now been kind of recognized as part of the working class struggle. Um, yeah. so, so the thing Feinberg is calling for there, that kind of plastic multiplicity, is is now the reality for us um, as a as a as a movement, right? Like that. Yeah, you're right. That like that the synthesis has been achieved largely. Yeah, I, I just I just think that it it the centrality of the class struggle has been reasserted in a way that he doesn't really acknowledge here because it certainly wasn't at the time he was writing, you know, like it was, yeah, yeah. It was like, Oh yeah. Unions, whatever. Like workers rights. Yeah. Whatever. Like, I guess some people care about that, but it's not really that important. There were, there were other things that were much more at the forefront of the political imagination, but today, um, I, I feel like, yeah, like the working class struggle is conce conceptualized by many people as sort of leading social progress at this moment. Yeah, and um, a lot of people are are either coming back or simply coming to Marx, right? Like that, mm -hmm. the, um, there is there is this recognition that like the um, labor or that the pr the production process is this kind of like gravitational field that orients or a magnetic field that orients a lot of stuff around it. Um, yeah, and we also have we have a more sophisticated notion uh, now of. Uh, the importance of reproductive labor to the reality of the working class, and that has become more of what is defined as 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 working class struggle, um, right? Like it, it, our our definitions have shifted because of the influence of of all of these you know new social movements that came along and uh, really pushed against the sort of conventional definitions of what the labor movement saw as its concerns. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, it's it's good stuff. Um, I kind of uh, get. I feel that the, this this episode or this this chapter, I suppose, might feel a bit like a kind of um, you know left punching sort of um, you know circular firing squad sort of uh, ordeal. But um, I think it's it's it seems to be necessary setup for um, establishing why this like uh, deep design critique of um, of technology is required, and that's what we're, we'll be getting to in the next chapter, right? Like, like we'll be getting to, uh, we'll be the, the chapter is called the bias of technology, and they'll be we'll be going through all the kind of ways in which technology is in fact biased, and also a concrete sort of theory of how we can get out from under that. Like, um, he'll will like all these terms that we've been referring to, like the the, the technical code and so on, will be properly and fully defined, and we'll get a clear picture of what's really going on beneath the uh, miraculation and uh, and spectac spectacular um, appearances of the thing. So yeah, stay tuned for that one definitely. <laughs> it's um it's maybe this 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 chapter's been a bit light and it's been a bit sort of like establishing why the critique is necessary because the existing critiques and the existing sort of um path that has been trodden by uh Marxism in the 20th century was was perhaps actually just insufficient. <laughs> and uh, and there is there is another another path to take, you know. Yeah, and it it's very much worth raising these points because you know, it's it's worth it's it's important to socialist strategy and tactics, but it's also just like important to have a rejoinder to the argument that like, well, yeah, like you know, management problems and stuff like uh, all all that's real real tough under capitalism, but in socialism, we'll own the means of production, so therefore it's not an issue, right? Like having an intelligent rejoinder to that argument. I think is is very important. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely crucial because we can't we simply cannot afford to repeat the same mistakes again. 
as much as as much as some some folks are absolutely fucking you know uh, committed to just replaying like rewinding the VHS that is the twentieth century and just playing it back again. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So yeah, being able to argue those fuckers down is good. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes. And I mean, and I think this this. Like, part of the purpose of this chapter was to... It was part of a time where salvaging the reputation and legacy of Marxism was very important academically, right? So, um, some of the things in this chapter may seem a little bit obvious to us today, uh, but when you think about the incredible uh, hostility and uh, dismissal of Marxist thinking that was characteristic of the 90s, the, it, it comes a little bit more into focus why uh, this would be something to focus on rather than just mention. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So is there anything else we need to cover? I have a feeling there isn't really. We've, we've given that a pretty good going over. Yeah, no, I think I think we've pretty much covered it and uh, look forward to the final chapter. Yeah, yeah, that one's, uh, one's going to be a monster. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a rather crunchy uh, chapter. Um, but yeah, yeah, we've sort of gone in, uh, out of the like intense theorizing and philosophizing, and then we'll go back into it again in the next yeah. chapter. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks, listeners, for um, coming along with us, um, and for in general coming along with the show as it is. Um, if you're wanting to keep up with us, maybe follow us on Twitter at uh, GI Unit Pod. Or on Facebook, if you search for General Intellect Unit, you know, maybe subscribe, all that kind of stuff, or just um, pass us along to people you think might be interested in hearing this kind of stuff as well. That's uh, one of the better ways you can help the show out. Um, and the, the second better, the second good way of helping us out is to um, go to uh, patreon.com slash General Intellect Unit and maybe throw us a couple of bucks a month to uh, pay for books and, you know, server hosting and all that kind of stuff. Um, and um, a little bit of a teaser, pay for travel costs. Ooh, mm, yeah, that's going to be nice. Uh, yes. uh, yeah, we've, got, we've got something coming up that involves travel. Uh, but yeah, it, otherwise, just thanks for listening. I mean, it really is, it is gratifying that anyone wants to listen to this thing, <laughs> you know. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I guess we'll see you again in a couple of weeks with uh, Chapter 3 of Transforming Technology. Thanks for listening, and goodbye. Bye.